Hey, Mook. Hello. What are you doing in there? Welcome to my crib. You got a bunch of crap in here, you know that? Hey, don't talk like that to me. <laughs> this is treasures. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Junkyard Digs, and welcome to the storage unit where I keep small engine stuff that is supposed to someday be a video. The reason we're here is because they've finally forecasted some snow in Iowa, and we want to go ride the old Arctic Cat 303 rotary powered snowmobile in that snowstorm. And in order to do that, we gotta pull her out once again and try to fix it. You ready, Mook? Why'd you have to bury it? I don't know. <laughs> So, if you guys did not see the last episode, I'd suggest go watch it. Uh, it kind of gives a little background on what the hell's going on right now. But, it's a very quick rebrief on what this snowmobile is. This is an Arctic Cat Panther, like we said. And this right here is a Wankel Rotary. And that's why I think this sled is really cool. 303cc single rotor, air-cooled motor. It's super tiny, like super small. <laughs> it weighs nothing. But when these sleds run, they sound really cool. I'm hoping that in today's video we get experience that. Let's see if we got any spark move. Oh yes. Oh yeah, we got spark. Well that's still good from last time. Okay, sweet. Still good. So with that, let's go ahead and take our pump apart and get the new seals in there. See if we can get this vacuum sigma line to work correctly. And then start working on the carb again. And see if we can get the sucker to run. Okay, we've got ourselves a whole list of things that needs addressed or fixed before this thing hits the snow. And at the top of that list is the fact that it still doesn't run with the crap. Slash at all, really. This right here is the driving diaphragm for our fuel pump, which is down in the carburetor itself. On a regular piston engine, I do not believe that you have this diaphragm because the pistons traveling up and down create that pulse of pressure that runs the pump in the, uh, well actually the fuel pump usually is separate from the carburetor, but in this case in the carburetor. This being a rotary, however, it does not have that. You know what, it kind of looks like it was almost working. <laughs> I don't think this is what I ordered. These have five bolt holes, which do somehow line up. <laughs> huh, now I'm curious what we can get away with here. I wonder if we could use this guy and this guy. And then another one of this guy, maybe. It's gotta be better than it was, right? I mean, maybe? <laughs> it seems to work-ish. All right, let's get a fuel system set up and see what happens. I doubt that was a problem. I think it has something to do with the fuel tang in here. I'm not giving up on that HL quite yet, but I'm eager to give up on it. All right, you old son of a gun, let's see what you do. I'm anticipating nothing, but maybe you'll surprise me. to idle and it has that awesome rotary idle but blah, 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 blah. all right our track is suspended in the air let's see if we can get this thing to dial on the high side and run a little better come on work with me and thus the problems begin <laughs> I thought this was going too easily I just find a minute ago
To make a long story short, the more I pulled on this, the worse its running conditions got, and the Tillotson would only let this motor live for a couple seconds at a time. I decided to pop the carburetor off, look through it once again, and make a slight adjustment to our fuel tab in hopes that it would allow more fuel into the motor. Upon reinstalling the carb, however, I learned that this actually somehow made conditions worse. Now, of course, common sense says I went too far and now it's flooded, but I had to actually choke this engine with my hand or turn the choke on to get it to even pop off. At this point, I was pretty frustrated with the Tillotson, decided to toss it in the bin and go hunting for some form of a round slide carb. I don't have any other sleds with this small of a carb that would have had a rubber boot that I could have put on here. But as I was digging around, I came across this. This is a carburetor off of a Honda three-wheeler. Either way, I spent some time looking for an adapter once again to put these together before I brought it over here and finally realized, wait a minute, this thing bolts right on. So I'm gonna get this bolted on, get all our connection hooked up, and we'll try this guy. This will be interesting to say the least. All right, I've got our Honda three-wheeler carb on here. This is probably going to need a ton of rejetting. Uh, right now it's even just gravity fed, but this is a proof of concept. I wanna see if this works. Okay. There she needs a little help here. Oh, that's plenty of fuel. I don't have hands for this. concept we do have a lot of jetting work to do but I think I mean think this could work all right so it's been a bit the next morning specifically last night I looked at this a little closer and really thought about what we got going on it doesn't like to run without choke which obviously means we need a lot more fuel but I think our biggest problem is the small size of this carburetor which is backwards from normal thinking in cars. Usually, if you put a tiny carburetor on an engine, people are like, oh, it's, it's gonna run lean, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be too lean. It's not, it'll actually, pretty much, if it's set up correctly, it'll never be lean. What it will do is restrict the amount of air the engine can move to the absolute volumetric limit that the carburetor can move. And at that volumetric limit, at 500 CFM, in a 500 CFM carb, it's still moving exactly the amount of air it needs to move for 500 CFM. So the engine will run right. It'll just be a little choked down. That's why from the factory, 400 cubic inch forwards came with a two barrel. Or you could get big blocks with a two barrel. This Spring Thunderhead 289 did a video series where he put a lawnmower carburetor on a 302 and it still made 160 foot pounds and about 80 horsepower and got 40 miles per gallon because I had a manual behind it and because he had it set up right. So with normal automotive style carburetors, specifically ones that don't have a needle jet, there's no such thing as too small of a carburetor if the engine just needs to run and drive around. Now, if you wanna make more power out of it once again, that's where you put the bigger carburetor on. Remember how earlier I said a 500 CFM carb at 500 CFM will flow the right amount of fuel? Well, that requires your engine to make 500 CFM. If you put a 750 CFM carb on a 350 Chevy that is not physically able to pump 700 CFM. When the throttle blades are all the way open, you will be pulling the absolute limit that engine can pull of 570 or whatever CFM through a 750 CFM hole. Especially with double pumpers where they are mechanically opened, you tell the carburetor how far to open, that's going to run lean because the engine cannot produce enough CFM to pull the proper amount of fuel out of those Venturis. Now you change the valve springs and cam and get that thing to wind out another two and a half thousand RPM. Then you can pull 750 CFM and a 750 might work out. Side note, that's why we suggest vacuum secondaries for all your street cars. 
side side note you don't have a race car you have a street car you drive it to work but on that vacuum secondary you tell the primaries how far to open mechanically and then the amount of air rushing through that hole creates signal to a dash pot which opens the secondaries equivalent to the amount of air the engine is pulling. So if you put a 750 vacuum secondary on a 350 Chevy, you're gonna be driving around like this a wide open throttle because you do not have enough air to open a 750, which is why that's the safer bet to tell people to put on their car because it has a limiting factor to keep them from doing this and blowing everything up. Now with all that being said, this carburetor is too small. <laughs> I know that goes against everything I just said, but here's why. On these round slide carbs, you have this right here. This is the throttle slide, and on the bottom you will see a tapered needle. As the throttle is actuated, that needle rises out of a jet down here, right there, you can kind of see the spot, and as that taper comes out of the jet, it allows more fuel to enter the engine. This is their metering system for fuel on a round slide carburetor. The problem with this is that needle and jet are so small in there that I am not able to get enough fuel to naturally come out of our main jet to run this motor. I could probably fix this by changing out the needle and jet, but comparing this to a snowmobile carburetor that I was looking at last night, this is a much tighter tolerance on that little four stroke needle and jet versus this 30 mil Makuni, which has a much larger opening in the front for fuel. It's just a, a way different setup. And this right here is a snowmobile carburetor. I went and picked one of these up from a buddy of mine, this local to us last night. Thank you, Tom, for giving me this. This is a about a 30 mil Makuni. Um, from the looks of it, it should also bolt straight on to that flange. It will. I'll pop the bolt off this, get it cleaned up, and then we'll put on the sled. Hopefully, this is going to be the ticket to make it run a lot better because of that much different ratio of needle and jet. And it's just set up entirely different for a motor that's 300 cc's and spins way faster than a 200 cc Honda. All right, let's go clean her up. Alrighty, it has been a little bit. I've been modifying our existing throttle cable to accept the slide, as you can see. And I spent a good hour or more cleaning out the internals of this McCuny 30. Um, to say the least, it's not great in here. It was actually quite bad. There's still a few things that I'm not too entirely sure of. So we're gonna bolt her on there and see what happens. Also, side note, and I forgot about this from the last video, but I just saw this sitting on the ground. If you're a snowmobile guy, you know what this is. That's the high fax. This is what the track slides on. Uh, you get snow between here and the contact points on the track and it's supposed to last a long, long time because it's a nice hard plastic. But since this is a thousand years old, it's turned very brittle and shattered. So I might have to figure out something for high packs. It's currently about one o'clock. I don't see any snowflakes yet, but we're getting close. Alrighty, we got her all hooked up. We got her choke over here. It just so happens to go down to where it catches a part of the motor and <laughs> holds itself in place. That was a happy little accident. Our fuel line's hooked up. We got our throttle. Let's see what happens. sure about was the idle jet. I had some issues with it. Blew in the tank a little. Let's see if that makes a difference. Got some news to say the least.
unfortunately a bad crank seal right there. You could hear I had a really high idle and when I hit it with extra fuel, it would die. What was happening was getting lean, getting extra air in there and idling up really good. And then I made it too rich and it shut down. I need to pull at least that clutch, probably the whole motor out of the sled and replace that crank seal. Fortunately, I have one. Unfortunately, again, I don't remember where it is because it's been a long time. Let's see if I can find that. All right, good news. That right there is the gasket. I found it. The bad news is that to do that, I got in the truck, drove all the way home, looked for some stuff, and then drove all the way back to find it sitting right over there. Either way, let's pop this clutch off, pop that side plate off, make sure our O-ring is good, and see if this fits. Might as well see what kind of broken parts we got in here. None broken, but a lot that need greased. Holy crap. I can't believe that worked at all. All right, so to actually get the backing plate off, there's a set screw on the back that I've loosened on this little clampy counterweight duda, which we'll get to. But for this guy right here, I'm just gonna toss some bushings in that hole. And I believe, in my mind anyway, I should be able to tighten this down and it should pull that clutch out. Three threads, that's not enough. I need something a little shorter to get a little more thread engagement. There it goes, okay. Now I got a nice amount of threads on there. I like that better. All that's left to do is turn this and watch the magic happen. Or watch me break something and then have all sorts of new problems. Oh, come on, where's the magic? I don't love how strong this bolt isn't. This is a tapered shaft, so it should just pop off. Oh, it just got easy, and I hope that's the good easy. Yep, there it goes. Ta-da! There's always a way to do something, and most of the time you can do it without the special tools and still get away with it without wrecking anything. That's where the line between reckless and genius comes in. <laughs> All right, get that plate off, change our seal. Look at that, a bearing. Looks really nice in there. The seal's seen better days. She's not terrible, which is probably why it was just a minor leak, but you can see it's, it's pretty thin and there's not really any good sign of contact there, so. Let's go verify that I have the right one before we pop this out and then pop it out and change it. Looking everything over, we do have the correct gasket. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this out. Set him on a nice surface like this. I've got a one and one eighth inch socket, but that doesn't matter. What does matter is the outside diameter. Get that as close to the outside of the seal as you can. I'm just gonna go ahead and keeping this as flat as I can. Tap them on out. If anyone at home has one of these sleds and needs to do this, uh, the part number is OS1504. This is a 30 by 42 by 7 millimeter gasket. For reinstall, we're just going to flip this guy over. Oh, he fits. Oh boy. <laughs> I was going to say he fits real nice, but I, I, can, I can push it with my hand. It feels good though. I don't, this is going to be just fine. It's not going to leak. Find about the right depth. There we go. I'm gonna make sure that's even. I need a little right there. Now I'll take some oil and get that seal wet. Yeah, this is actually a different, this is a better seal. It's got two ridges to seal, or the old one, at least at this point, only has one. So this has twice the sealing surfaces. Hopefully this is gonna be way better. The next thing I need to address is this O-ring around the outside. See if I got something laying around here that I can make fit. Everything is back together. Should be sealed up really well. Get our hardware back on that, get that tightened down, and then I will clean our clutch up, reinstall that, and then we're good to try this again and do a little more tuning. Fire truck? Yeah. Meanwhile, our uh, snowstorm is starting now. It's kind of just raining right now. My Johnson's outside getting wet. You hate seeing that. No one likes a big cold Johnson. You want to tug that thing and let it warm up before you ride them. They've got really bad issues with uh, internal slap, if you know what I mean. Anywho, back inside. Oh boy, it's coming down now. I've been working on this clutch. I had a seized roller. We're getting her freed up now. I'm going to get that all lubricated a little bit, dry this all out, fill it with graphite where it needs to be, uh, or where it could use some assistance, and then we'll put her back together. You want to use graphite in this because wet lubricants will attract the dust from the belt. 
and then it'll gum everything up. These are dry clutches. All right, our clutch is all cleaned up, full of graphite, and put it back on. We have noticed we have a bit of a loose belt, but man, we'll deal with that when we have to deal with that. Let's see if our new crank seal makes a difference. Notice finally what this mark right here is coming from. I thought this was weird. There was nothing really in line with this. The motor torques over so bad that it runs into this bolt. I don't know if there's a... Oh, actually, the whole... It's this guy right here. The whole entire subframe up here is loose. I guess we'll deal with that next and then move on to fuel system stuff. But finally, that rotary runs good. At least free revving, which really means nothing in the real world, but we'll get to that. All right, so now that we have a running motor, we need to find ourselves a way to supply fuel to it. But unfortunately, as you can see, things are not good. There's, that's the, that's, that's the fuel cap with the level gauge on it. It's down in there. Oh God, those are the lines. Oh man, that is so bad. Feeling a little overwhelmed by the Arctic Cat at the moment, I decided to take a break and help my buddy Ben, who was working on his sled motor in the background. Well, things aren't going great over here. <laughs> this is Ben. This is the guy that does our merch. He's also the guy that gets all your emails when you go on the website and fill out the wrong contact form. Uh, the one that says merch in giant letters is for merchandise. Mm -hmm. Goes to Ben. The one that says contact Kevin below that, that one goes to me, Kevin. What are you working on, sir? Well, this is my uh, 700 XC SP 05 Polaris, and uh, we had a little trouble with it last weekend. Broke the crank. Apparently that's supposedly repairable. We're gonna try to repair it. The craziest thing, my favorite part of the story as far as like a technical wow, that's amazing. When this, obviously that blew out, the same thing as what we just fixed on the Articat, that PTO side seal, engine crank seal, mm -hmm. obviously got a little mangled and started breathing air through here and into the motor. And if you'll notice, this was that side piston. See how warm you got right here versus the other one? But that's not the crazy part. The crazy part's what happened. <laughs> Felt a little vibration. And uh, before I could get pulled over and stop, she popped real loud and uh, she didn't stop turning. The tack got pegged up around 10,000 RPM. I hit the kill switch, nothing stopped. I pulled the tether, she kept going. I took the key out, she kept going, we pulled the spark plug wires, she was still going, and uh, that finally part, that choked That part's it crazy out. right there. He yeah. opened the hood, unplugged the spark plugs, and this thing was dieseling so lean, so hot in this piston, that despite the throttles not being open, 10 grand. Yep. And then choke of all things is what it was able to kill it. Yep. During that time, obviously this died, that piston got warm, but the worst of all, if you listen, Looks like we spun a bearing. In fact, when this was still in here a couple of seconds ago, we could spin this and all the other ones were stationary. So it spun a roller bearing in it. Nice, yeah, look at it. So you got a little work to do. Got some work to do. A little doubt on life right now about snowmobiles. <laughs> I think we got something that might make you feel better. There's two inches of snow out there in an Arctic cat with no seat. You want to go test ride it? I do. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on. There she goes.
It's just sticking to the warm skis. Damn it, this is a great first ride. <laughs> skis up in the air. Come on. This isn't snowmobiling, I don't know what is. This is snowmobiling. pushing a huge pile of snow in front of it. Oh no. <laughs> now I'm just further from where we need to be. I think we still have some jetting work to do. It seems to have approximately no power. Holy cow. <laughs> you did it though. You snowmobiled. I snowmobiled. We snowmobiled in Iowa this year. I don't know if you can technically clear these out like a normal engine uh, by holding the throttle open. I don't know anything about Wrangle. I don't know anything. What I do now is I got a truck and a tow strap. Yeah, yeah, I'll go get them. I spent the next day moving snow and doing some office work before finally getting back out to the shop to work on the Arctic Cat once again. Once out there, I began the rather painful process of removing the tank from the Arctic Cat. Instead of bolting in or anything, they used the rails on the side to kind of lock it in place on top of a sticky foam pad. I had to remove all the side rail bolts, spread them as much as I could, and then use a bar to break the tank away from that pad and finally get it off the sled. There. Got it. With the tank finally freed from the sled, I set to getting all the rust inside of it out. At this point, I was still hoping to save the original tank because it didn't appear to be in that bad of condition and it was the only one I had. However, once I checked a couple soft spots with the wire wheel, I started to realize that this tank was in way worse shape than I had originally anticipated. We have got 10,000 holes in this tank. Like, that one's the size of my finger. Those ones are huge up here. The entire top of the tank is peppered with holes on both sides, just completely eaten through. This side's not bad. This side's got the biggest hole in the whole thing. <laughs> The more I looked at this, the more sure I became that there was pretty much no hope in saving this tank. And if there was, it definitely was not in a timely manner. I stared at it for a little longer and then decided the best course of action was probably to head out to Tom's and see if he might have something out in the woods that can help me out. No trespassing! Can you That's fix a nice my, piece. Can you fix my spaghetti strainer? Yeah, I got bubble gum. <laughs> I got junker. Bop. I swear to God, it looks like the same tank to me. It should be. If you've got an early 70s up to 78. It might look the same. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be cool if we go through all this and it's just as big a piece of shit. I filled it up with water to make sure it didn't leak and it didn't leak. And then I got the wire wheel out. Yeah, so you never holes. clean them. I guess not. If they don't leak, leave them alone. <laughs> With that, we wandered out to the woods and found ourselves a 70s Arctic cat that appeared to have the same tank. Oh, hello there. You sure you don't want this whole snowmobile? <laughs> I've had enough trouble with one of these this week. <laughs> Let's get her inside. So if it wasn't already apparent, Tom is one of us. And the fact that he likes old cars and old sleds. And junk. And junk. Well, there she is. She's pretty good looking. Beautiful snowmill. Yep. Whatever. Just about ready for the I-500. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Now I gotta do this again. Yep, pretty much. That's step one. It's already made out of duct tape, so no loss. Yeah. Okay. There. I like your method a lot more than mine. That's this still is the only good. thing salvageable, and it didn't get broke. <laughs> it came <laughs> off. Perfect. <laughs> if you needed that, there's no way it would come off. No, it would have broken taking it out by taking the screws out. Alright, there's that side. Ready? Yep. 
Bingo. Now we should be able to just abstract this. Look at that! Done. The question is... Is it worse? Is it better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we got a tank. Let's take her back to the shop and get her put on. The next morning, I headed down to Phoenix's shop to shot blast the new tank and check it for holes. Ready to put a whole bunch more holes in my tank? <laughs> Hopefully, we don't blast right through it. Hopefully not. This side looks a lot better. You might have a few more pins. Ah, damn it. <laughs> That's the side that was good on the other one. All right, I get the JB weld out. Alrighty, we're back in the shop. We have got our fuel tank freshly sandblasted by the guys down at Phoenix's. I've got a few thin spots here I may need to address. Uh, but more importantly, the backside, as you may have seen, it's got a bunch of holes in it. So that's gonna be a problem. First up though, before we get into that, we need to clean up the inside of this thing. I saw this on TikTok once. Uh, I know how cliche that may sound, but some guy had a little jar of Drano and he'd dip his rusty parts in it and pull them out nice and clean. So I of course thought, shoot, I should pour that in a rusty gas tank, see what happens. So that is exactly what we are going to do. Maybe this will work, maybe it won't. Maybe it'll burn a hole through it. Maybe it'll explode and fill us all. Um, what is that? <laughs> it must have froze. That's not what it's supposed to look like. All right, I'll dump this in. We'll roll it around and be back in a bit and see how it did. Well, to say the least, I don't have a ton of faith in that. We'll see what happens. I do have a little control going on over here with a different brand. I will say that I bought the cheapest ones I could find at Dollar General, so yeah, that might be a part of it. In the meantime, I suppose I'll clean up this uh, tunnel here. After an hour of cleaning and polishing the tunnel, I decided to go check on our Drano. Um, I mean, the, the goo turned brown. The, hmm. I don't know about this. Our control external test over here. You can kind of see where that did something. It honestly looks like it made it rusty. Look at this one. I mean, there's a slight change. Well, it's not doing what I would have hoped, that's for sure. <laughs> this bolt. Maybe, actually? I don't know. I guess I'll leave it for now and keep cleaning. All right, I've got our tunnel all cleaned up. Our dash is clean. The hood's been cleaned again. This thing looks honestly awesome. This sled is in very, very good shape. There's a crack in the windshield, which I think was us last time. The bumper is perfectly straight. The foot rails are perfectly straight, not a single bend. The handlebars are good. The rear bumper, which I forgot to clean, is also good. This thing has to only have a couple hundred miles on it, if even. With that being said, the thing that's bothering me now is those skis. Those rusty looking skis do not fit the rest of the sled. While that's still soaking, I think I'm gonna pop those off, run back to Phoenix's, have him shoot them, maybe even coat them for me. Not to self, buy new hardware. Oh, the carbide still look pretty good. <laughs> well, actually, they're mostly gone. Maybe there's more miles in this sled than I thought. Also, side note, this is probably a lot of our problem not being able to move through the snow. Is, see how rusty this is? Just like plowing in a field when those furrows are all rusty. They, that, that plow pulls twice as hard. But once they clean up on the dirt and start gliding through, they move a lot easier. I'm sure we're seeing the same thing on snow with this. All right, get these off, get them taken apart, get them down to Phoenix and have them clean them up for us. I'm back. I brought you more shit. I got something to show you. You have something to show me. What could this be? Oh, dude, yes. Is that trail fire? It is a trail fire. Oh, it's got flames? Oh, <laughs> does it run? Oh, yeah. It <laughs> lights rusted off. The high facts are gone. It came with a folder with like 300 pieces of paper in it with like all the work, all are, the work done what? To it and like a full maintenance. It's got book. this has a full history report. What? 
<laughs> I don't think I've even mentioned at this point in the video, the reason we're fixing up the Arctic Cat and all these other sleds that are in this video is because next month in Chatek, Wisconsin, they're hosting a snowmobile rally event, something like that. And Angus has a cabin up there and we usually go up there. So if you guys are in the area, February 25th, find us somewhere looking like a bunch of idiots in old vintage clothes and vintage helmets on vintage sleds up in Chatek, Wisconsin. And if you're not, keep an eye out for the video because we're going to do a $500 vintage snowmobile challenge. Let's see if it starts. Heat on joke action. <laughs> <laughs> I swear this worked when I <laughs> Dude, if that isn't snowmobiles, I don't know what is. <laughs> Oh! Oh! She's got a little work. Yeah. A little work to be done. If you want to see Phoenix fix this up, check out his channel, Wrench and Redneck, here on YouTube. I know Pole Barn Garage has a video out of his sled already. came out last week. Yep. Uh, this is going to be a whole bunch of fun up in Chatek next month. So if you guys are local, come find us, have a beer, watch us break some stone builds. I don't know. We'll see. Let's go make some parts shiny. With our tank still soaking in Drano and Phoenix powder coating the front skis, I wound up with some extra time to remove the engine and clean the entire front of the sled. With that job done, I checked on the fuel tank once again and still was not seeing any results. I dumped out the Drano, rinsed the tank really well, and then took it over to my bench to hopefully solder up all the holes on the back of the tank. I had never tried this before, but I figured, hey, if it works on a radiator, I don't see why a little more heat won't make it work on steel. It wasn't the prettiest fix, but I was able to seal up all the pinholes on the back of the tank. I kept at this for a while until Phoenix showed up with all of our front end parts. Man, hand delivered and everything. <laughs> I brought gifts. So you said you were gonna high temp spray paint this. Yes. I said no. <laughs> Do you have high temp powder? I have high temp Cerakote. Ooh. So stuff's really good, holds up to anything, withstands 1800 degrees. Holy crap. Will look a thousand times better. So I shot it quick, fresh out of the oven. They are still warm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't turn out too bad for as rusty as they were and stuff. Dude, those look excellent. They are. Like slippery now. It almost looks brand new right there. On yeah, that. <laughs> it's gonna make the rest of the sled look like I need to clean it again. Yeah. Sweet. Well, thank you very much, sir. No problem. Anyone watching this is local in Iowa and needs some powder coat work done. Phoenix, where do they get a hold of you? you? Can either go to our Facebook page or our website. Our shop number is on there. It only works eight to five, Monday through Friday. <laughs> so don't be calling us to ask about Kevin because some office lady is going to answer it and have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> That's happened oh, one too many times, unfortunately. I can tell. But. But yeah, if you guys have any work that you want done on snowmobiles, tractors, cars, whole truck frames, you can fit. What's, how long is your oven? 20 feet long, 20 10 foot feet long. wide. 10 feet tall. I mean, if you got a truck frame, if you got a thousand parts, we can do it all. And if you work for a company that needs some powder coat done as well, most of it's probably commercial. Yeah, a lot of local stuff with, you know, Ames, Marshalltown, uh, Ankeny, Des Moines area. Some some Boone stuff, and even Iowa Falls, surprisingly. That's wow. about an hour, hour and a half away, so. Well, I mean, when you're the best in the area, it's hard there to we see. Go. Hard to find anyone better. <laughs> <laughs> Once Phoenix left, I finished soldering up our fuel tank and decided to head home for the night. Good morning everyone. I've been a busy little basher this morning running all over the place. I ran out of the toms and stole the carbides off that other Arctic cat that we were tearing apart the other night. With that cleaned up and installed, I've got our skis back on ready to go. I slapped our motor back in, the belts back on. Everything is looking good under here. She is nice and clean under this motor. The skis Phoenix powder coated look absolutely excellent. Those should glide through the snow, especially with that powder coat. Pretty much everything up front is done. The only thing left now is to put the tank back on, put our seat back on, run a new fuel line, put a pump in, and we should be good to ride. With that being said, let's go check on our fuel tank and see if it made any progress overnight. Last night I threw some of this in. I've had this sitting around forever. These guys sent me this a few years ago and I've just never used it. Uh, they say mix it with one gallon of water. I filled that all the way to the top and mixed it with five. So, <laughs> so let's see how that did. Being mixed five times too thin. Ooh, actually, that wall over there looks excellent. Huh. All right, let's dump this out and see how it is. Yeah, I would say that did something. Holy crap! And this was mixed five times too thin. Five gallons of water instead of one. 
there's some big flakes yet, so I think I need to run this to the pressure washer again. But we've got ourselves a great tank. So I guess we've learned something. Leave the Drano at Dollar General and go get yourself some of this metal rescue rust remover bath. This stuff works excellent. I'm definitely going to buy some more of that. I'll go pressure wash this and we'll bring it back, paint it up, and get it on the sled. Alright, we're back from the car wash. Take a look at that. The inside of that tank looks incredible. That's There's a little pitting over here, but I'm not worried about that. And the good thing is this is two-stroke uh, gasoline, which has oil in it, so it should actually help that not rust even more. That metal rescue stuff is, works amazing and is probably a new standard for me. Let's get this painted up and get this thing reassembled, finally. With that, I ran some new fuel lines, painted our tank, installed it on the sled, and finally put the seat back on. At this point, what was supposed to be a quick carb swap and fuel tank clean has turned into a three-quarter restoration of this snowmobile. I've put a whole three days of work into cleaning this sled up, and at this point, it looks awesome. So the only thing left to do now is fill it with fuel, throw it on the trailer, take it out to our house, and see if it'll finally drive through the snow. Mook, we did it! We finally did a snow machine-based video and got it done in time to use it in the snow. I think this is a first for the channel. And now for a first for this thing, let's see if it'll finally move on its own. seems about right. We did it! We actually rode the rotary powered snowmobile for the first time since I've owned it for I think two years. I wasn't sure if this thing was going to be good or not but it, honestly it is excellent. <laughs> it's got some real Yamaha and Ticer vibes. A little lightweight sled with some good power. It's, it's surprisingly powerful actually. Like I know I could have a lot of fun on this. I bet it'll do probably 35 40 mile an hour easily with me on it so thank you guys very much for watching this episode if you happen to be near elk river minnesota next weekend january 28th ish i think pretty sure it's the weekend of january 28th in elk river minnesota vintage sled ride i'm gonna try to have this there uh, especially after riding it for like 300 feet. That's my goal because this was a lot of fun and I think we could pull it off. Thank you guys very much for watching this episode. If you're new to the channel, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. We got a lot of great stuff. Check out some of the other content as well. We'll see you guys right here next week for another episode of Junkyard Digs. Peace.
also, one more thing I forgot to mention in the video. If anyone has, well, many more of these, let me know. But if anyone has or knows where an Arctic Cat 606, the twin rotor model is, please let me know, junkyarddigs1 at gmail.com. Likewise, if they know where there's a Johnson 45, the rather rare 45 horsepower rotary Johnson from the, like, 76, 77. Okay, goodbye.